My name is Paloma Chacon, and I am the descendant of Mexican immigrants as well as Italian immigrants, and I am actually for the border wall, and I myself am a Catholic and conservative. And so my question for you is, is there a biblical argument that is supporting the wall or against illegal immigration? Well, we certainly see a lot of walls in the Bible. Sometimes they come tumbling down, and sometimes they get built up. Nationalism itself is a profoundly biblical concept. We don't hear talk in, in the Old Testament about vague, uh, vague forms of government in which everybody is just sort of with everybody else. In the Old Testament, we see clearly nations, and we see that certain nations are a light to other nations, and we see that there is a diversity of nations. And uh, this proceeds into the New Testament as well. The civil authority is defended in the Bible. You'll recall that when Christ was born in the inn at Bethlehem, his parents were on the way to register with the census. They were on the way to register themselves with their government. Uh, we see throughout the uh, epistles from St. Paul that the civil authority is to be protected, the civil authority is to be respected. We see it from the mouth of Christ himself, who says, render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. Because the question of nationalism has to be viewed in the, que in the question of what other form of government we would have. I suppose the alternative that's being proposed today is some form of imperialism, some form of a broad overarching government run by, say, the United Nations or the European Union or whatever, and they're going to run the whole world better than our nations can themselves. These experiments in empire have almost always failed. Why? Because they infringe on the liberties of the local populations. The nation state, as we've had it for the last 400 or so years, has done the best job of ensuring equality, justice, and liberty, specifically of protecting liberty. When governments are too small, when they're too fragmented, liberty can't really be protected. You, you have a, an immediate liberty and then they all get conquered. When governments are too big, there's no accountability, there's no reason at all for a far distant power to protect your rights or your liberty. The nation state has done this incredibly well. And the United States has been the greatest of all of the nation states. And it has dealt with the questions of immigration, with questions of sovereignty, with questions of protecting the world order, obviously better than any other country. That cannot happen if the open borders activists of the left wing have their way and erase the nation state itself. Yeah. Good question. Hi. Uh, I'm a full-time professor here. I also am Italian-American, and I happen to agree with the protester in the back. Um, well, I, I have to say, as a professor, that you would come. I really appreciate that, because I know students come out a lot, but professors don't always come out to hear opposing points of view, so that's a wonderful thing. It's my duty. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> I've left you and speechless. You I've have, dazzled uh, you. Thank you. In, you know, in 1492, before a racist and genocider came to this land, there were people living here. Every inch of this land was occupied. It, it just and as a as a matter of history, not every inch of the land was okay. occupied. It was it, it was there were huge areas that were completely wilderness. I like to. I was quiet the entire time you spoke. There, those people still exist. The North American indigenous people, Central and South American, they're still here. And I would like to know how you can say that they have no ancestral claim to this land and that as a white person, you can say that they cannot migrate freely and cannot use the land freely that they rightfully own and have for thousands of years. Well, Mike, I'd like you to be more specific. Which people specifically and which land specifically? Because there were lots of different peoples in the northern and southern, uh, in North America and South America at mm -hmm. the arrival of Christopher Columbus. So which mm -hmm. people do you think have a claim to which land? I'm talking about the Native Americans. But there were many America. different Native American tribes. Would you tribes. like me to name all the tribes? I'm yes, sure. and I'd like you yeah, to name, and the to reason I would like you to name all the tribes is because there were many tribes who conquered many other tribes. So just as an example, that's, thank you, just as an example, the Comanche Indians come in and they conquer areas run by the Apache Indians. Now the United States comes in and it owns that land. To which tribe should that 
revert? To which tribe should that land revert? The Comanche who had it before us or the Apache who had it before them? Moreover, for the people who still exist, you're referring to Christopher Columbus in an ahistorical way by calling him some sort of racist or some sort of genocidal maniac. The man never committed any sorts of genocide at all and he was actually known among the Spanish explorers for his good treatment of the natives. That point is neither here nor there. And, and I encourage people to read biographies of Christopher Columbus because there's a lot of historical fiction out there. The point on that is that when the Spanish came to this country, they did, and to this continent, they did create a new race known as Latinos. This is a mixture of Spaniards and Native American populations. So if we are going to revert certain land to Native populations, why would we not then immediately take that land away from them because they also descend from Spanish explorers. In what sort of atomized way would you define your own race, your own identity? I think this is a very backwards and ultimately impossible view of personal identity that, that puts your, your stock in some particular ancestor rather than something that is larger than yourself. I think it's a madness of the modern left and it leads to, uh, to crazy policy proposals such as saying that somebody who descends from a native population in Colombia has a right to move to any apartment he wants to in New York because of race or something. Uh, you, I, we can certainly have a response. Thank you for not answering my question and in the future... I think I did can, answer you. Well, you how can, specifically I, could I answer your question? If you could not lower the microphone until the person's done speaking, I think that'd be better for everyone. Thank you. That's all. So you were done speaking. <laughs> I think, I think the, the gentleman did just fine then. <laughs> Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Jeremy Lechner. I'm a member of the Master of Fine Arts program in television, film, and theater slash acting option. I apologize. We have to say it every time. I like to say it. Um, my question is, it, it's more of an issue. You say that in your speech that it's not anti-immigrant rhetoric, but simultaneously in your speech, you spoke about those who support a cap on legal immigration. You specifically said that. You support uh, required assimilation and specifically you talked about the need for I think the word you used was ethnic identity if I'm wrong I no, apologize. No, quite, quite the opposite. Quite but the I believe opposite. that's what you said. That is not what and I said. I'll, I'll clarify what I said just for your edification. I said that the United States does not have a particularly ethnic identity because of the unique historical development and settlement of the Americas and specifically of the United States, which I think is a very good thing. I think the left is trying to forge new ethnic particular identities here. I think that is a very bad thing and I think the only way to stop that from happening is to encourage assimilation as you said. Okay, well in light of that though, I do still have to ask, do you not see any contradiction in saying that you're not anti-immigrant while simultaneously giving voice to those who support a cap on legal immigration and requiring assimilation. I'm not giving a voice to those people. The public opinion polls are giving a voice to those people and it's the majority of Americans. The reason that I mention this is because I'm not anti-immigrant, I'm pro-assimilation because that is the only way that a, a country, particularly a country as diverse as ours, can possibly cohere. We, there is no way to tell an American just by looking at his face. That's a beautiful thing. But then how do you tell an American? The only way you could tell an American is by his language, by his culture, by his traditions, by his defense of the values that the country is founded on. There are many people in this country now who do not want these very high levels of immigration. I think that anxiety is not caused by even questions of crime or even questions of access to welfare programs. I think it's all about culture and we can bury our heads in the sand and pretend it doesn't exist. But by the way, if that happens, when people go into that voting booth where they can't be publicly shamed for holding perfectly reasonable points of view, you are going to get politicians who perhaps in the future will be anti-immigrant or perhaps in the future will advocate policies that none of us would support. There's a simple solution to this, which is that when people come to America, they ought to behave like they're in America. They ought to behave like they want to be here. They ought to leave the vast majority of their former national identity behind. They're leaving those places for a reason. My great-grandparents left Italy for a reason. They came to America. They loved being in America. I love being an American too. I go back to Italy. I like it. It's a nice vacation. 
I don't feel a profound connection to Italy. I'm as American as apple pie. I, that's a wonderful thing. Everybody in this room could be as American as apple pie. But it requires that you embrace an American culture. Sure. My perception is that if someone comes to this country and they extort or defend the values of our constitution, of equality, of liberty, of the rights of human beings, that that alone is enough to make them an American. I don't consider language or culture to be a part of it. My own great-grandparents came to this country. They spoke their native language for many years. They abided by the customs of their religion from that country for many, many years. My grandparents still do. But they are certainly American. My grandfather fought in the Korean War. So to me, saying that language or culture determines if someone is an American is effectively, sir, telling me that an American soldier, my grandfather, was not an American because he preferred or enjoyed aspects of his former culture. No, I'm certainly not saying that. I'm not saying that there is one exclusive criterion that makes you an American. You're the one suggesting that by saying reading the Constitution and believing its words makes you an American. But if your grandparents, who sound like wonderful people, had no knowledge of the English language, I'm curious how they would read that U.S. Constitution. I'm curious what language that Constitution was written in. It was written in a language for a reason, because a country is much more than a sheet of paper. I love the Constitution. It's a beautiful sheet of paper. It is not the totality of our country. Our country is built on so much more than that. It is built on a shared history. It is built on a shared experience, bonds of kinship that bond us all together, customs that we engage in, traditions that we all engage in. I will notice, I don't have any knowledge of your grandparents, but I do have a little bit of knowledge of you. You seem like an American. Clearly, assimilation has happened somewhere down the line. Why did it happen? Because it's a good thing. It helps you get ahead in the country, and it's the right thing to do in the country, and it's the reason we all came here in the first place, which is to become Americans. Hello, uh, my name is Don Gabreas. I'm also in the undergrad theater department. Um, you stated earlier that there are um, these ideals that, um, or like, no, let me, let me rephrase that. Um, that um, there's like certain um, things that Americans should have that like um, let's see uh, the melting pot specifically that uh, we should all come together and be as a uni united country under like certain like under aspects. God in the yes, under God and justice for yes, all yeah. definitely um, I'd like you to uh, what what would you say are some of those qualities then if uh, if I if I really ask that would make someone American then. Well, uh, some of the values are pretty clear. The country was founded on the idea that we have uh, natural rights endowed in us by our creator, such as the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We inherit a system of government from the Anglo tradition, so we inherit a system of law and government from the English, and it is transformed and developed in a uniquely American way. So adhering to those laws and, and customs is one thing that could do it. There is also culture as well. One thing that makes you as American is speaking English. Another thing that makes you American is eating at McDonald's. Another thing that makes you American is going to baseball games. Another thing that makes you American is going to forums like this and discussing different ideas and not becoming outraged or violent or smearing people of all sorts of nonsense because they go out and they have a different point of view. The free exchange of ideas is a profoundly American concept. It seems like basically everybody in this room is engaged in that. You can't exactly put that down in a little book you can't just say, do these three things and you'll be an American. Because culture is much more profound than that. If you can list it all out in some sort of doctrine, in some sort of manifesto, you're probably not covering the whole of it. It's not just some ideas. It's the experience of living together and loving your country and having gratitude for your country and having hopes and aspirations for your country. That, that's, that will get you a, a little of the ways toward understanding what it means to be an American. Then, um, to go with that argument, uh, isn't it then that when people are able to question their country and question out some iniquities that they find, that isn't that also considered profoundly American? When people who are from other races or other people who come here who aren't um, represented, when they bring up their arguments about um, not being treated fairly, is it not in our best interest to hear those out and help to 
bring them into the American psyche instead of just telling them that there's these certain rules that they have to abide by? Well, of course, uh, open, as I just said, open exchange and open debate is profoundly American, and resolving problems is profoundly American. Freeing the slaves is a profoundly American thing to do. You had 600,000 Americans massacre each other to free a, a specific group of people over ideas that they found embedded in the American founding and the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. That's a wonderful thing. I'm not quite sure what that has to do with whether or not the United States is allowed to protect its borders. I mean, that is ostensibly the topic we're discussing here. And I think what, what we're being told by, for instance, that sign from the protester back there and from other people is that to say that a nation is allowed to have borders somehow is not only encouraging violence, but it actually constitutes violence, which is completely incoherent. I mean, it just does not have any semantic meaning. It's like saying blah, 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 blah. It doesn't mean anything. And, and to say that it's somehow un-American to protect the borders of America, I don't think makes a whole lot of sense. We should have open discourse. We should also make sense when we're engaging in it. Um, hi, so my question is less about the border and more about the illegal immigrants themselves. Namely, what do you think that, what do you think should happen to the illegal immigrants who are here? They haven't committed crimes and they're not dreamers, but you know, they cross the border seeking a better life. And you know, they're very hardworking people. Do you think we should just get rid of them or should we let them stay? Well, unfortunately, because this problem of illegal immigration has been exacerbated by a full political party in the United States not enforcing the laws that all of us through our representatives put on the books, because we're now at a point where the law has been totally disregarded, then it seems to me the equitable way to deal with people such as that is on a case-by-case -case basis. So the, the, unfortunately, the question would have to be, which illegal aliens are we talking about? Obviously, every, we all live in Los Angeles. I grew up in New York. Everybody knows illegal aliens. Some of them we want to keep in the country because we think they'll be good for the country and they like the country and they're good people. Others are not. We probably know some of those people too and maybe they should get out of the country. That is a problem that unfortunately if you're going to disregard the rule of law on the way in, the, the uh, practical solution is probably to disregard the law on the way out. That doesn't actually solve the political problem. So when, when people bring these cases up, they say, don't you think, we'll give amnesty to all of the illegal aliens now, then we'll secure the border. You don't actually want to deport all of these illegal aliens and these foreign nationals living in our country. So we'll give them all amnesty, and then, only then, will we secure the border. And guess what happens? We've tried it before. We tried it during the Reagan administration. We give amnesty to millions of illegal aliens, and then the border never gets secured. So as a political matter, as a matter of the law, we need to secure the border. We need to shut down illegal immigration profoundly. We know in places where we've built the wall along that border, illegal crossings have dropped by upwards of 90%. If we did that, if we could reduce illegal crossings, which are now, right now at this moment, 3,000 per month, if we could reduce that by 90%, then let's talk about how to deal with people who are already in the country. I am, as a political matter, I am not willing to even entertain that question until the border is secure. Uh, I'd like to start off by noticing that as each speaker gets up here, the speaker, this speaker then goes ahead and answers, and his supporters get to go ahead and applaud. I would like to start off by applauding the people that have the courage to stand up against this hate. You're certainly welcome to applaud anybody you like. I take no responsibility for who applauds for what. Well, you haven't given them space. That, that was my point. Um, but I do, have, I do have questions here. It, it, what, I, what I was saying is, is the structure here has been very specifically designed to go ahead and to support a particular point of view. I, uh, could you give an example of that? Because here's what I think happens. People come up and ask me a question, and then I give them an answer, and then somebody else comes up and asks me a question, and then I give them a, a different answer. Is, could you please show me the nefarious and unfair structure of that Q&A? I, 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 I'll, I'll be happy to, because after their last comment, you get a chance to comment, and your supporters go ahead and applaud. When the, when the speaker is then going ahead, and when the, when the person from the audience is talking, 
you immediately talk afterwards and there's no oh, space. Yes, that's true because they're asking me a question exactly. because I'm the speaker and exactly. they're the ones asking the questions. It's exactly. Right. So, so I guess they can go give a speech somewhere else and then their, their supporters can go and applaud them. But that's not what we're engaged uh, in here. So, so the, you do agree then that there was... That I agree that I'm giving a speech and people are asking me questions. I agree with that, yes. I didn't, I didn't know that I had to clarify um, that. Um, so, so let me go ahead and, uh, frankly, there's so much mis misinformation here, I don't even know where to start, but I will try. You talk about melting pots and assimilation. I don't know to what extent you cook in the kitchen and you don't cook. I have no idea. Well, I'm of Italian descent, so I can work my way around the kitchen a little bit. Th th if that's the case, then you will know that a melting pot is not something that you take a pot, you put the first ingredient in, and you add other things and you expect everything else to go ahead and take on the flavor of that first ingredient. Rather, a melting pot is a, is a mixture of different ingredients. And some of those ingredients you want to blend in and other ingredients you want them to maintain their character and you don't want them to blend in very much and you put them in in a particular order. And you, you talk about what makes America. There's plenty of things in this country that are, a, that are a huge problem, and there's plenty of things in this country that are very good. One of the best things about this country is, is that as each culture comes in, we're able to go ahead and look at that culture and take on the best things from that culture. This, uh, uh, America is not a English-only culture. We have taken on from all, all different cultures, and it's... It's the strength of this country that we have gone ahead and taken on. It's the strength of this country that you can't look at, at people and tell which ones are Americans and which ones are not. Right, that's what I said in my speech. Um, that, that's, not that, that's, that's literally that's not what I said in my speech. What, what, what you said is you expect them to assimilate. Right, I expect assimilation, and I said it's a beautiful thing in this country that you can't look at someone and tell who's the American and who isn't. But, I, I said but, the but, exact but, same but, line but, that you but, just said. But, but you seem to imply that when people come in... Well, you know what they say happens when you assume. <laughs> yeah, is there a question or is this a speech? Yes, yes, there is. What's a, the question? Okay, so the, so the question is, is do you realize <laughs> that a hundred years ago, you, you, you mentioned that Previously, people have come in and then they immediately assimilate. A hundred years ago, there were areas in New York City where you couldn't function if you couldn't speak Yiddish, if you couldn't speak German, if you couldn't speak a Slavic language. 130 years ago, in Kansas, the, uh, in a very large area in Kansas, German was such a predominant language that the Native Americans assumed that the language in this country was German, not English. We've never that would had, be a true tragedy. We, we've, we've never had a situation where people come in and they immediately start but speaking. But I, I never claimed that people immediately assimilate. I never claimed that in my speech. I think you're making fine points. They're just not points that in any way contradict what I've been saying this afternoon. I'd like to ask just one more question, then I'll, I'll, I'll leave. Um, in the past when uh, the young Americans have had speakers here, you, you mentioned that each person gets one question, and you've been very accommodating about letting many of us have a conversation. But in, in the past, there's never been that kind of a, of a statement. And I'm just wondering why there would be a statement here. It sounds like you're afraid of having a conversation. Though I will admit that you have been carrying on a, on a, on a conversation. And um, I, just, I just want, in closing, I just want to say that what's really important is that we embrace other ideas and other cultures, not that we assume or, or force people to go ahead and take on what's already there. Well, I appreciate your comments. I would like to point out that uh, it seems you have uh, criticized me for saying things I didn't say. I agree with many of the points that you've made. And then you're criticizing uh, other speakers who have spoken for Young Americans Foundation instead of me. So I'm pleased that you had a nice time at the lecture. I agree with many of your points. And I, uh, I love the open exchange of ideas. I heard you, sir. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> all right, so the Constitution protects my freedom of speech. We can all agree on that. 
And part of that free speech is speaking whatever language I want to. So talking about the cultural assimilation, you're saying that um, we should assimilate to a shared language, but what if I, a US-born citizen, does not want to speak English? Well, if you don't speak English, chances are you wouldn't be able to read the First Amendment, so I'd be surprised if you would know about that right in the first place. There's a, a premise that a society has to have. The Constitution didn't spring into existence in thin air. It was dropped down into Thomas Jefferson's lap. He said, good, finally, we've got a country. We have a country because before anything else existed, I got this peach of parchment called the Constitution. That's not what happened. What happened is that our system of government and our Constitution and all of the institutions that came out of our Constitution developed out of a time and a specific culture. We inherited them not from 10 years before it was written, not from 20 years before it was written, but from the ages and ages before it was written. It is part of the inheritance of our culture. These are the premises of our culture. If one is to come in and say, I reject all of the things that undergird our Constitution, and in this very specific example, that includes the English language, then one is to say, I reject the Constitution itself. You cannot cut yourself off from the culture that has made you. You can do it for a very short period of time, and it ends in the political madness that we're seeing around us today. Sure. Uh, so what you're basically saying is rejecting English is rejecting the Constitution. I'm saying rejecting a common culture in the United States renders the Constitution meaningless. In the case of the English language, it literally renders it meaningless. You wouldn't be able to read it. What if someone translated for me? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a little skeptical of that translator. Obviously. We have, we have, I speak multiple languages. I assume people in this room speak multiple languages. I love reading literature in other languages. I like going to certain bakeries and speaking in French or speaking in Italian. That's a wonderful thing. The question is, how do we conduct ourselves as a country? How do we conduct our systems of government? How do we conduct diplomacy? How do we conduct the law? Beyond just the question of language, which is really a symbol of so many other cultural questions, what do we have in common? If we don't have a shared, we, we've already established that American is not a particular ethnicity. American is not a particular race. There have been so many different races and ethnicities that have been involved in the settling, founding, and establishment of the country. So if it's not a race, if it's not an ethnicity, and if we don't have a shared language, and if we don't have a shared culture, and if we don't have shared food, and if we don't have shared clothing, and if we don't have shared music, and if we don't have shared movies, and if we don't have shared anything, then what makes us American? <laughs> well, you say racism, but then why is it the case that the United States takes in fourfold the number of immigrants than even the second most generous country is uh, in the world? Why is it the case, if, if America is a racist, awful country, why is it that everyone keeps wanting to come here? The door is open. We don't have a border wall. You can leave. You can walk right out. Why is it not, why is it not just that so many people, four times as many people as go to any other country in the world, come here every single year? Why is it that you don't leave if you really believe the things that you're saying? It's because you don't really believe them. Uh, one, of, one of the protesters out there said that, that uh, America is based on racism. Well, uh, language is not an ethnicity. Language is a system of symbols that we use to communicate our ideas from one brain to another brain. Ethnicity is not a cultural group that includes language. I, whoever, whichever teacher at Cal State LA taught you that, you should ask for a refund on the class. I speak, I speak French. I don't, I'm not French. I speak Italian. I'm not even really Italian. Some do. English is a very popular language. Uh, English is spoken by many more people than the English. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. Well, I don't know what you're trying to say. You're trying to say that, that language is somehow ethnic, that is, it is exclusive to ethnic groups. And what I'm observing is that manifestly, all of us in this room are from different ethnic groups. We all speak the English language. Good series of questions. Hi. Um, um, you may have said this answer to my question before. I'm, I don't know, but I just there's something I heard while I was in line. Um, why? I think you're good. 
Why do you insist that we all have a shared, similar culture? Don't you enjoy enjoying different culture and music and language? Is there something wrong with it? Well, uh, yes, I think I've answered this, but I'll ask you the question that I have asked other people who have brought this up. No, if, I'm, if I'm we, asking you a question, so I would like an answer. Well, because there's nothing else that binds us together as Americans. That's, that's the short answer. Other than English. I, the English language is part of our culture. And that does not as bind a, us together as Americans? Yes, a shared culture binds us together as Americans. Okay. I don't know how to state that more clearly. Well, you tried your best. I, I did try my best. I did try my best. Hello. Um, you cited a list of statistics in your talk which you claim support the idea that illegal immigrants are dangerous or criminals. I'm, I'm, I s cited a number of statistics that show that they commit federal crimes at a significantly higher rate than native-born Americans. Yeah. Okay. So what role do you think that structural racism and inherent bias has to play in those statistics? I don't think that the people who enter this country illegally are forced to do so by some sort of systemic racism. There's no systemic American racist going down to El Salvador and saying, you better get up and sneak into the United States. And there's nobody in the United States who forces people who come here illegally to commit crimes. I think the premise of this question is actually quite offensive, though it's a popular assumption, which is that illegal aliens somehow don't have free will. It's the assumption that illegal aliens are somehow morally uh, uneducated. They have no sense of right and wrong. They have no ability to control their, their emotions and their impulses. This is obviously profoundly racist and not true. We have free will. We have the ability to do what we want to do. This is why, by the way, the majority of Hispanic, Im uh, Hispanic people in the United States and Hispanic voters oppose illegal immigration. The, the races are exactly the same. The ethnicity is exactly the same. The question of, of crime is different because race does not determine your criminality. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that people of color are more likely to be convicted of crimes unfairly than the, white people. They're more likely to commit certain crimes. That's true. I don't think that's because of their race. I think it's because of aspects of their free will and perhaps of culture. That, that's not true. I'm talking about... That I'm is true. I'm, I mean, what I just well, said is true. I'm not quite sure where you're getting your t statistics from, and you choose from to the federal government. Them. You choose to interpret from them the in your Bureau of Justice Statistics can and I, can Department of Homeland Security. Can I talk? Is that well, okay? you, you, you said you didn't know where I got my statistics from, and I'm telling you where I get them from. Well, you, it would have been nice if you could have let me finish my sentence. Anyway, you well, I was using... I was answering your question. You are using your statistics for your own political agenda, and that's your I'm, prerogative. I'm citing statistics because they're true. I'm talking about the fact that I am, I'm faculty here. I also support our support, uh, um, protester in the back. What do you support specifically? Do you, do you think that anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech? Yes, because of the you, reasons you think that, that I'm speech is about. violence? Uh, no, I think that that's the, what that sign says. The conversation that you're having is oppressive. It, um, and so it I am oppressing people by what I'm doing. So I, am, I am exerting violence on people by my speech. It that's what the sign says, and that's what you just said. It contributes to And the protester is saying that's exactly what I'm doing, and she's saying that's exactly what her sign means. So that means that you, a faculty member at an American public university, paid for by taxpayer dollars, are conflating speech with violence. Yes. Um, speech can be violent. What you are saying contributes to systemic racism in this country. It means that my students of color are pulled over and accused of stealing a car when they did not. I'm not pulling anybody over for stealing I'm any not cars. I, that you I see many did. people of many different races in this room. I, I, they all seem to be doing just fine. I don't think I, any, any of them have felt violence because they listened to a lecture on, on basic facts about our immigration system. The question was, have I asked people in this room if they've felt as though some violence has been committed on them? Uh, no, I haven't asked because no violence has been committed on you. Because violence is not a subjective feeling. Violence is an objective fact. 
I can objectively gauge whether or not someone has become violent. The other day, I was at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Some protester attacked me with some weird chemical. That was an objective act of violence. But somebody disagreeing with me, such as some people in this room are doing, are not committing violence on me. And I would say to you, as a faculty member at a taxpayer-funded university, this is the foundation of liberal education. If you cannot understand that there is a difference between speech and violence, you don't understand anything that undergirds the liberal arts or liberal education. And that is a real shame. And I say this with all respect and with great distress for our universities. If our teachers don't under, understand the difference between ideas and violence, between speech and violence, then they are in no position to educate the next generation of Americans. I've been to art school for eight years. I understand liberal arts extremely well. I am an artist and I fully I don't think you do. I'm sure you've been to art school My for eight years, but you do not understand the liberal arts. a sign which says disrupting speech is fascism. You are No, no, no. The sign says anti... Oh, oh, that one. Disrupting speech. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yes, See, you, you understand? Yes. You these people it? who are yelling are disrupting my speech You're and I agree it's fascism. It. You're interrupting me, and I think that you need to look up violence in the dictionary or expand your idea of violence. <laughs> Hold on, I'll, I'll look it up right now. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me look it up. Let's see. Violence definition. Hold on. Violence definition. So you're saying that, that violence can be a speech. Oh, my Wi Fi went out. That's too bad. I'll look it up later. I'll post it on my Twitter. Violence is not speech. Let me say it again. Violence is not speech. Let me say it for all the professors in the room. Violence is not speech. Speech is not violence. Hey, so. Hi, I'm Kat. I'm a liberal studies major here at Cal State LA. Um, I wanted to mention a few points that you brought up earlier in your speech. You said that because we think walls are wrong, we must also think walls are sinful. Um, no, that's what Nancy Pelosi said. That's not what I said. That's what, okay. So Nancy Pelosi said, it's immoral. said that immoral. walls are immoral and sinful. Okay. Um, so you also said that the U.S. intervened, he, that the U.S. funnels money into other countries, right? In aid and things like that. Is right, much more than any other country in the history of the world by a long shot. Um, did you also talk about how the U.S. intervenes in countries in other ways, like war, um, and that the U.S. is, commit is tearing up these countries? And Which countries these are in the particular are you that concerned are fleeing? for? Um, okay, so. You, you mean when the United States invaded I, Afghanistan can I, can I to overturn the can Taliban? I, can I do you think? Well, I you're, you're, because you're making statements okay, that are okay, not specific, okay. so, so I want to get to the heart of your question. Okay, but let me just with what I'm giving you right now, try to answer my question. Okay, so if the U.S. is intervening in, intervening in countries and these well, when countries we give foreign aid, we have intervene. immigrants that are fleeing, where do, these, where do you expect these immigrants to go when the U.S. intervenes in these countries that don't ask for U.S. intervention? Which country? Well, uh, yes, if the Taliban in Afghanistan didn't ask just, for U.S. I'm intervention. Just it as well, I guess they did ask for question. it when they I'm flew to I'm not going to, to specifically and... narrow it down to any sort of. I know specific... you can't narrow it down because when you get specific, your point falls apart. In, no. the, gener in the general, your point sounds like it makes sense. Listen but to in me. the specific, it doesn't make sense. Are you going to let me? Okay. So, where do you expect these immigrants to go? You're blaming the United States for the free actions of people. What, what speci I mean, if, if, if your point but is that... But you know that, what's out of these people's control is U.S. intervention in their countries, right? Well, U.S. foreign aid is intervention in other countries. I don't think that they would say no to that sort of intervention. What specific intervention do you take issue with? What specific intervention okay. do you believe is, is egregious and the fault of the United States and demands that we not have national borders? So, um, what if somebody I support over there is holding up a sign that says anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech. And the reason they're holding up that sign is because this anti-immigrant rhetoric became violent when children began being put in cages and attacked. You mean during the Obama administration? <laughs> Oh, okay. All right. Well, go protest Barack Obama. Don't go protest and you want me. This to continue, right? You're, sa you're, you're saying that the, the anti-immigrant rhetoric became violent when Barack Obama put kids in cages 
And this is somehow my responsibility? This is what part like of what makes it violent, is that there's children in cages. You mentioned that women there, that become there raped, cages, that you mentioned women that are raped when they cross the border, but you're not mentioning the children that are being raped in the detention centers at your borders. Well, 80% of uh, women and girls who cross the border illegally are raped along that journey by the sadistic sociopaths who have been permitted to run free along the border. What percentage of children who have been brought in by their parents to this foreign country, what percentage of children are you suggesting are being raped by US government officials? The children in the detention centers. Hold There's on, children that went missing on, but, uh, as well. You, you made like, a claim, and I'm just asking what percentage of the children being, you, you said US children in US detention are being raped by government officials. Do you have any evidence for that whatsoever? I you said they're being, they're, they're they're being be, raped in detention centers. By I whom? Mentioned by who? By whom? I? By whom are you suggesting? Okay, but who's keeping these detention centers? So you don't have an. By whom are you saying they're being victimized? If there's a, if there is an epidemic of children being uh, victimized in these detention centers, and you have some evidence of that, you better present that. That sounds like a terrible thing. So children are separated from their parents not because of a policy of Donald Trump, not even because of a policy of Barack Obama, but because of, of a policy that was determined in 1997 called the Flores Agreement during the Clinton administration. And the reason for that is that when illegal aliens come into our country, they are apprehended by law enforcement. But if they're held for longer than a, a short period of time, you can't put children in jails. I don't think anybody wants us to put children in jails. That is literally caging children. So the children are separated from their parents because the parents are dealt with by law enforcement and the children are dealt with by the Department of Health and Human Services. The, the only alternative to this would be to put children in jails or else to let the parents go free without any consequences for entering the country, which is to say the only alternative is totally open borders in the United States. Is that what you're suggesting? So you're saying the children in cages right now aren't? Which children? Are, how many children are in cages right now? The children at the at the, how at many? the detention centers. I mean, you're so certain of this. How many children the are in cages right now? The federal government received more than 4,500 complaints in four years about the sexual abuse of immigrant children who were Which being years? held at government-funded detention facilities, including an increase in complaints while the Trump administration's policy of separating migrant families at the border was well, in there's place. Well, there's also been a surge in illegal immigration. We now have 3,000 people per month coming into this country and a surge in children. So naturally, any offense that involves children is going to increase. I agree with you. Illegal immigration is a horrific and immoral action, and it should not be encouraged by craven politicians who think that they can grab a few extra votes by encouraging the victimization of desperate foreigners and their children. Um, how you doing? How you doing? Um, uh, I'm a big supporter of the Daily Wire. Thank uh, you. I like Ben Shapiro, regardless of what people think of him. <laughs> Well, I'm a little like lukewarm on him, but that's okay. I, I see how he thinks about you. Um, what I don't understand is um, why a lot of my own people don't see that the Democratic Party is politicizing us and using us to pass laws that aren't going to actually benefit us. I feel, I, I feel like they're like a lot of us are blind, you know, with as far as speaking English or Spanish. I, I couldn't imagine going to China and not learning the language. How would I go find where the bathroom is or... Any other country get a, yeah. I, and But yet, but I don't think people should not speak the language. They could speak it in their house, but how would they communicate with their neighbors? You know, I, 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 I'm wondering when Amer being proud to be an American became racist when America doesn't have a race. You know? I'm wondering exactly the same thing. I'm wondering exactly the same thing. I think uh, part of that is because you have people, we've now heard from two faculty members at this university who have said that if you hold the opinions that you and I hold, that we are fascist, we are racist, and we are committing violence against Latinos. Apparently you're committing violence against Latinos. I didn't know this. You're apparently self-flagellating or something like that. This, this is an opinion held by two w white liberal people who are teaching at this university. And I point them out because it creates a culture that stifles free speech. It, it is no accident that the vast majority of virtually every voting demographic in this country, including Hispanics, including Democrats, opposes illegal immigration. And yet, 
in the popular culture, if you were to say that, you would be baselessly smeared as some sort of bigot or some sort of fascist or some sort of whatever stupid slur you want to throw in. The only thing that we can possibly do is speak up and look them in the eye and convince our neighbors and not allow them to bully us and shut us up. But it looks like nobody's going to bully and shut you up, so that's a very good thing. And I, I find it funny that these two non-Mexican uh, professors are trying to speak for me. I don't need anybody to defend my race for me. I wonder how many uh, Mexicans that they help on a daily basis, if they're buying flowers off of people uh, on the side of the freeways, or if they're judging people like me, you know, when, when we walk by them. You know, I, I get judged on my race a lot by these people, but yet in these kind of uh, forums, they pretend, they pretend to defend us, and it's very hypocritical. Like I'm standing in the back while you're trying to answer questions and they're screaming, uh, uh, don't interrupt her, as they're interrupting you. And, and the, hip, the hypocrisy is real and I just wanna say that not everybody of my race thinks like they do. You know, there's, there's a bunch of us who are waking up and uh, I just wanna let people know that, you know, we're, we're not all a, a, a monolith. You know? Of course, everything you've said is absolutely right. I wish, I think unfortunately those professors left so those professors didn't show you the courtesy that you showed to them. You listened to their question and the answer. They didn't show you that same courtesy. I'm not surprised at all. Generally speaking, white liberals are very good at being offended on behalf of other people. They never ask the other people's opinions. They ever ask what they feel about it. They're just very good at, at unfortunately, exploiting racial and sexual and identity politics to push their own agendas regardless of the consequences of those policies on the people that they're pretending to help. And in the case of illegal immigration, this leads to widespread violence, sexual violence and, and violence for 70% of people who cross that border illegally. It's, it's disgraceful and it, it's, their, it's the way that they conduct politics, unfortunately. Yeah, great questions. This will be the last question. Uh, yes, hello. My name is Brandon Van. I'm a political science uh, major here at Cal State LA. And um, I guess my question is kind of like a simple one. Um, I would identify myself more as a libertarian, so I wouldn't really like be for or against the wall. But much of the land that would uh, be where the wall would be built is private land. So I would ask you, um, what do you think the government should do? Do you think they should invoke in imminent domain or do you think like we should buy, like somehow like go around this? There will not be a simple answer to taking that land. There will not be a simple answer to constructing uh, that length of, of, a, of an edifice. That said, if there were ever a use of eminent domain, it would be in securing the border of the United States. Much more important than zoning some area of a little community so they can have a new ice cream shop. It is much more important to be able to, to build border security along that southern border. And if that involves purchasing the property from people or invoking eminent domain, uh, more so than, than any question of national construction, the interstate highway system or any other, uh, that, that must be given priority if we are not to act as a nation, if the federal government does not have the right to act to protect the nation itself, what power does it really have at all? I also have another quick question. Um, yeah, with the regards to the caravan that is coming to the United States, what do you think that the, US, the, the federal government should do? Because as a libertarian, I believe that the United States should not be, you know, um, subjected to the demands of foreign citizens that it does not have responsibilities to, but at the same time, uh, denying them entrance into the United States seems a bit inhumane. So how do you think that the federal government should solve this problem, and how do you think we can deal with this in a humane way? There is no chance that the way that the United States handles immigration is going to even come close to resembling something that's inhumane for the very, very near future. We take into, or the very, very distant future rather, we take in fourfold the number of immigrants of even the second most generous country on earth. We take in so many people each year. If we shut down the border right now, we would take in more people this year than any other country on earth in immigration. And so 
the, the question that we have to do is be able to identify people who are simply economic migrants, who simply want to come here and get a job, maybe people who would benefit the country, maybe people who are good for the country, maybe people who would love the country, and people who need asylum, people who genuinely are in fear for their life, and we have a very generous asylum system, so we take them in, and people who are fakers, and people who are criminals, and people who are human traffickers, and people who are coyotes. Uh, bad people, bad hombres, to use the phrase of the president. We have to be able to identify who those people are. We currently cannot do that. We have a shortage of judges, and we have a, a totally porous border that is unprotected. The answer to that is not to let the floodgates open. If anything, we have to err on the side of caution. We have to err on the side of protecting the country, protecting our laws, which were passed by our representatives because we, a self-governing nation, voted for them. We have to err on the side of protecting the United States of America, which even if we did it today, if we shut down the whole border today, we would still be the most generous country with regard to immigration in the entire world. Yep. Great question. I would also like to thank President Covino for not shutting down this lecture today. I began to fear that he would do that just a few days ago when he sent out an email to the university community lamenting what he referred to as the cost of free speech. Apparently I'm the cost. This is the cost of our First Amendment. He wrote, as a public university we uphold the right to free speech, but I want you to know I recognize its cost. This is a quick side note. Whenever anybody uses the phrase, I support free speech, but nothing good will ever follow that. And that is certainly the case here. President Covino did not directly name me or the Young Americans for Freedom chapter that invited me to speak today. The timing and the subject matter of his letter clearly references us. Last week, when YAF tabled to advertise this lecture, scores of campus leftists approached and chanted, among other creative slogans, F. YAF. Now, instead of confronting this disgusting behavior of those students and the growing ideological intolerance on campus, here and at other campuses, President Covino instead chose implicitly to criticize conservatives. He wrote in his letter, quote, I cannot remain silent in the face of actions that ostracize our students who are immigrants or the children of immigrants when the actions of a few on our campus lack the compassion and sensitivity that characterize healthy dialogue, it is our collective responsibility to restore those values. I stand in unwavering solidarity with all of our students, regardless of their immigration status. My Italian immigrant parents, grandparents, would expect no less of me. To demean and insult in a blatant attempt to provoke others is wrong. Dreamers and other immigrant students are transforming their lives through education and realizing their dreams. Dreamers, what a euphemism. What does dreamers mean? I dream, you dream. Every time I look on the inside of my eyelids, there's some dream. I have literal dreams, I have metaphorical dreams. That's not what he means by that. He's using a euphemism because he won't use the specific and precise phrase, illegal alien. President Covino's message is clear. If you do not support the so-called DREAM Act, that is, if you do not support amnesty and open borders for millions of illegal aliens, you are some sort of bigot whose speech is unwelcome at this university and would be banned outright if not for that pesky First Amendment and all of the taxpayer funding that pays President Covino's salary. Ironically, in this letter, the only person demeaning and insulting anyone in a blatant attempt to provoke is President Covino. There is nothing bigoted about the belief that a country has a right to borders. There is nothing bigoted about the belief that a free people has the right to determine who gets to enter their country, to access taxpayer-funded services, and to affect their institutions of government. But moreover, there is nothing compassionate about an immigration system that flagrantly disregards the rule of law that encourages desperate foreigners to risk life and limb to sneak in, that empowers sociopath criminals to traffic human beings, that enriches drug-dealing cartels to poison whole generations of Americans, that threatens the life, liberty, and property of American citizens. Illegal immigration is illegal. It really is not that complicated. Up until just a few years ago, virtually everybody in the country agreed on this basic fact. 
Although today they clamor for open borders, in 2006, many prominent Democrats actually voted for the wall along our southern border. Chuck Schumer, Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama all voted for the wall in 2006. Today, however, nearly every top-tier Democrat presidential candidate has called for the total abolition of immigration and customs enforcement. House Majority Leader Nancy Pelosi tells us that physical boundaries on our national borders are expensive, ineffective, and immoral. Clearly, something has changed over the last decade. Now, of course, this new argument doesn't make any sense. For starters, a wall is not that expensive. Mitch McConnell said the wall will cost between 12 and 15 billion dollars. A 2016 estimate from Bernstein Research puts that price tag between 15 and 25 billion. A leaked report from the Department of Homeland Security pegs the price at around 21.6 billion. Even using the higher estimates on all of this, that constitutes a drop in the bucket. Our federal government spends that much money every 48 hours. Relative to our total federal spending, a wall along our southern border would barely register. Walls also are not immoral. We have a guest in the room, a protester, who delightfully is remaining quiet, but she does have a sign that says, anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech. It suggests that there is some conflation of speech and violence. Thankfully, the American universities have not totally bought this absolutely incorrect idea, which justifies violence, the sort of violence that I experienced at the University of Missouri, Kansas City just last week. The morality is the question. Walls are not immoral. We know this intuitively since we all live and work within walls. We are within walls right now. <laughs> walls are keeping us safe. Walls are a lovely thing. They protect us on this campus. Walls protect Nancy Pelosi. If walls are immoral, then all of us are sinning right now, not just right now, we're sinning all day long. Walls also are not ineffective. The reason we build walls is because they work. They work to protect us personally. They work to protect our country. Where the United States has installed border fencing, Along the Yuma sector, in particular in Arizona, border apprehensions have fallen by upwards of 90%. It is also worth pointing out, just as a matter of simple logic, the claims that walls are ineffective and immoral cannot simultaneously be true. The, the left says that border walls are immoral because they prevent illegal aliens from entering our country. But if the walls are ineffective, that means that they don't prevent illegal aliens from entering our country. If the wall is ineffective, the wall is not immoral. If the wall is immoral, it can't be ineffective. So how did the left get so extreme on the question of illegal immigration to suggest that anti-immigrant rhetoric, which is, by the way, not what we're engaging in, not even close, actually constitutes violence? How did they get so extreme within the span of just one decade? How did they go from voting to build a border wall along our southern border to encouraging unfettered open borders? As with so many bizarre leftist behaviors, the answer can boil down to two words, Donald Trump. It can boil, there are other things as well, but President Trump is for our immigration laws and so Democrats are against them. President Trump is for the wall, so Democrats are against it. President Trump is against the unfettered free flow of foreign nationals into our country and so Democrats are for it. At the moment, this is a losing proposition for the left. Our friend back there says anti-immigrant rhetoric is violent free speech. Polls consistently show that Americans of every demographic group disagree and disagree strongly. These polls show that Americans consider immigration, both legal and illegal, a top concern. A poll conducted last year shows that 63% of Americans favored increasing merit preference over preference for relatives in immigration cases eliminating the diversity visa lottery and funding physical barriers on the U.S.-Mexico border. That includes 61% of Hispanic voters, 55% of black voters, and even 63% of Democrats. The majority of Hispanic and black voters and even the majority of Democrats support restricting immigration and obviously dealing with illegal immigration. 
That same poll showed that 88% of voters support ending chain migration. That number includes 83% of Hispanics, 88% of independents, and 77% of people who voted for Hillary Clinton. 62% of voters believe our current border system is insufficient, and that number includes 55% of Hispanics and 64% of independents. Just about any way you slice it, I could recite statistics all day long. The majority of every voting group opposes illegal immigration. Why is illegal immigration so unpopular? One reason is that non-citizens commit a disproportionate share of federal crimes. You won't read about this in the mainstream media, but it is true. Left-wing politicians and news outlets regularly insist that illegal aliens are actually less likely to commit crimes than native-born U.S. citizens. This is not the case. As the Heritage Foundation pointed out, the reports that these media figures regularly cite are misleading because they conflate the crime rates of citizens and non-citizens and legal and illegal aliens. They also rely on self-reported criminal offending and country of birth information rather than using official crime data, which are far more reliable. The Government Accountability Office concluded in 2005 that criminal aliens make up around 27% of the federal prison population. This surprised a lot of people because non-citizens comprise only 9% of the nation's adult population. Do a little math and you will find that non-citizens commit federal crimes at three times the rate of citizens. That same year, in 2005, the GAO reported an average arrest rate of 8.3 arrests per illegal alien, as well as a criminal offense rate of 12.7 offenses per illegal alien. Those statistics just take into account crimes committed by illegal aliens who wind up in prison. They completely ignore the substantial number of crimes committed by illegal aliens who see their charges dropped when immigration authorities agree to deport them whether or not they actually end up deported. According to a study from the Crime Prevention Research Center, just in Arizona alone, illegal aliens are 142% more likely to be convicted of a crime than other Arizonans. They also tend to commit more serious crimes and they serve 10.5% longer prison sentences. They're more likely to be classified as dangerous and they are 45% more likely to belong to a violent gang. Even adjusting for the fact that young people commit crimes at higher rates than older people across demographic groups, young illegal aliens commit crime at twice the rate of young U.S. citizens. According to the GAO, there was a 40% and 25% increase, respectively, in criminal alien incarcerations in state jails and prisons between 2003 and 2009. All of those statistics also ignore the fact that illegal immigration is itself a crime. And any crime committed by an illegal alien in the United States would not have occurred had the politicians done their jobs and actually enforced our immigration laws. But we shouldn't pretend that illegal immigration only harms the native population and that it's all upside for illegal aliens. In fact, the existence of a porous and unprotected border also creates a system of perverse incentives that harm illegal aliens themselves. This speech Contrary to the protesters' sign is not violence, but an open border and the encouragement of illegal immigration does lead inexorably to a lot of violence. Between 60 and 80 percent of women and girls who cross our southern border illegally are raped along the journey. That is not some scare statistic cooked up by some anti-immigration group. Those numbers come to us by way of Fusion and Amnesty International and reported in the left-wing Huffington Post. According to the Department of Homeland Security, 70% of illegal aliens who enter our country across that border will suffer violence along the journey. That violence, sexual or otherwise, is not inevitable. It does not have to be so. We have the means to dramatically reduce illegal immigration. Unfortunately, many left-wing politicians see too much political upside in encouraging this violent system of perverse incentives. And those Politicians who encourage illegal immigration have blood on their hands. Supporting illegal immigration is a losing issue among just about every single demographic, including Hispanics and even Democrats. So why has the left come to embrace it? 
beyond just reflexively doing the opposite of whatever Donald Trump wants to do, why has the left specifically come only to embrace illegal immigration from Latin American countries? When foreign nationals enter our country illegally, they cut the line. They potentially take a spot away from someone who could have entered this country legally. Why does the left support unfettered illegal immigration from Latin America at the cost of increased immigration from other places, such as Asia or Africa? The answer is simple. Votes. Democrats believe that by importing millions of foreign nationals into the country, over generations, they will give themselves an unbeatable electoral advantage over Republicans. And the data show that they're probably right. According to Pew Research, Hispanics are five times as likely to identify with the Democrat Party as with the GOP. This trend holds when you limit the survey just to registered voters. There are well over four times as many Hispanic voters registered with the Democrats as with the Republicans. Even for Hispanics who don't identify with either party, they are two and a quarter times more likely to lean toward Democrats. Native-born Hispanics are 4.4 times as likely to identify with Democrats. Foreign-born Hispanics are 5.6 times as likely to identify with Democrats. This lockstep politics, this modern lockstep politics among Hispanics in the United States is strange. Most immigrant groups over time tend to mix up their politics. A good example of this are my own ancestors, the Italians. Antonin Scalia, Nancy Pelosi, Andrew Cuomo, and I all descend from Italian immigrants. That is the only thing we have in common. <laughs> there is very little else that we have in common. Over time, the descendants of Italians become politically indistinguishable from the American population as a whole. The same is not true for the descendants of Latin American immigrants today. Foreign-born Hispanics who have been here less than 10 years are just under three times as likely to identify as Democrats. That number jumps to 8.75 times as many Hispanics who have lived in the U.S. 10 to 14 years identifying as Democrats. The number holds around 8.2 times as many Hispanics who have lived here between 15 and 19 years identifying as Democrat. Then it drops back down to a still lockstep, rock solid, 5.2 times as many Hispanics who have lived in the U.S. for 20 years or more identifying as Democrats. Any way you slice it, continued unfettered illegal immigration means electoral death for Republicans. By the way, Democrats admit this strategy. They are very honest about what they're doing when their memos get leaked. A leaked memo from the left-wing Center for American Progress Action Fund in 2018 explained that amnesty for illegal aliens was, quote, a critical component of the Democratic Party's future electoral success. That memo was written by Hillary Clinton's former communications director, Jennifer Palmieri. So the left embraces open borders, no matter how many Americans oppose it, and no matter how many illegal aliens face rape and violence along the journey. But why do Hispanic immigrants, both legal and illegal, stick with the Democratic Party these days? I suspect the answer has less to do with the Hispanic immigrants themselves and much more to do with these days. In recent years, the U.S. foreign-born population has reached record heights. It hit 43.2 million people in 2015. That number is still climbing. The number has climbed steadily since 1965, when Ted Kennedy completely up upended our immigration system. Since that time, the number of immigrants living in the U.S. has more than quadrupled. Immigrants today account for 13.4% of the U.S. population, triple the immigrant share of the U.S. population in 1970. The foreign-born percentage of the population has not been this high since 1890. That might explain why a recent Harvard-Harris poll last year showed that the majority of Americans want to dramatically reduce not just illegal immigration, but legal immigration as well, by as much as 60%. The majority of Americans want immigration capped around half a million, which is far down from the current level of 1.3 million per year. Why is this? Part of this anxiety might be material. Immigrant-led households are far more likely than native-led households to access welfare programs. According to a study by the Center for Immigration Studies, the majority of immigrant-led households receive at least one kind of welfare benefit, whether that is food stamps or Medicaid, housing assistance, or school lunches. That number drops to just 30% for households led by native-born Americans. 
regardless of race or ethnicity. That discrepancy holds even when you only look at households with children. But I suspect the anxiety over immigration that we see reflected in that poll has less to do with material calculations and a lot more to do with culture. Because at precisely the moment, the 1960s, that the United States opened its doors to a dramatic surge in immigration, it also abandoned its traditional insistence on assimilation, the melting pot. In any society, the assimilation of immigrants is difficult. In a society that opens the floodgates to immigration while simultaneously encouraging them to retain their cultural and linguistic identity, assimilation is impossible. Unlike in decades past, official policy encourages immigrants, and specifically those from Latin America, to retain undisturbed the national identities of the countries that they have left. This is why we press one for English when we call customer service. This misguided policy not only does not help immigrants, it actually prevents them from becoming Americans. What makes an American? Unlike virtually every other country in the world, the United States lacks a particularly ethnic identity. This fact seems to be lost on groups like La Raza, one of the largest Hispanic identity groups in the country, with chapters on virtually every university campus. La Raza regularly accuses the United States of racism, which is very ironic because, for those of you who are not familiar with Spanish in the room, La Raza means the race. It, it takes its name from La Raza Cosmica by Mexican Education Minister Jose Vasconelos, who, coincidentally, had that republished at taxpayer expense in 1979 at Cal State Los Angeles, right here by the Chicano Studies Department. And that essay, which was published right here at taxpayer expense, this racist essay describes students from English, Dutch, and Scandinavian backgrounds as, quote, slower, almost dull. <laughs> Does someone applaud that? Yeah. I'm Italian, so you can't offend me. It describes black students. This same essay describes black students as uglier stocks and part of the inferior races. Is anybody going to cheer that one? I don't think so. It describes Hispanics as a new race, quote, infinitely superior to all that have previously existed. La Raza is wrong about most things, but they are right that Hispanics are a relatively new race, a race created by Christopher Columbus and the introduction of Spanish explorers to the various Native American populations in the New World. The Latino race is the product of the discovery of America. That fact alone it is. You're laughing, but uh, the Latino race is the introduction of Spaniards from Europe and Native American groups from the West. So you can laugh, but it's a pretty basic historical fact. America was discovered by Italian Catholics sailing for Spain. This is sailing for Spain and France. It was explored by English sailors in service of the Dutch. It was settled by Dutch fur traders, later by English Puritans. It was cultivated by West African slaves. It was then developed by various waves of immigrants, first Irish, then German, then Asian, then Italian, then Jewish, now again Hispanic. Unlike virtually every other country in the world, you can't tell an American just by looking at him. Also, unlike other countries, this lack of a specific national ethnic identity creates an urgent need for law enforcement and cultural assimilation. We must speak the same language. We must embrace the same traditions. We must value the same values, or else we will cease to be a country. Other than our traditions, our laws, and our values, there is very little that binds us together as a country. Simply put, unfettered immigration without assimilation means the end of the United States. The US doesn't need to exist. It won't be around forever. It hasn't been around forever. Plenty of different peoples have occupied these lands. Some peoples conquered other peoples. Other peoples made treaties, negotiated, and purchased the land. Many did both. In America, there is no particularly ancestral claim to this land. In our time, America has become the freest, most equitable, most just, most prosperous country in the history of the world. Among the nations of the world, the United States has been the greatest blessing in history. This fact should go without saying. If the US were not the greatest country in the world, if it were really some rotten place 
like the left wants to convince us it is, then why does everybody keep coming here? They must all be so crazy to go to that rotten place, America. They must, they must be crazy, or else, or else, it's the greatest country in the history of the world. Our military protects the world order. We give away a full 50% more in foreign aid than any other nation. And we take in more immigrants than any other nation on earth by a factor of four. One in four international immigrants from around the globe lives in the United States. There has never been a more generous country in history, specifically with regard to the question of immigration, than the United States. It's a shame that an entire political party in this country would be willing to risk all of that in a cynical attempt to grab more votes, would continue a violent and horrific open borders incentive just to grab more votes. Likewise, it is no wonder that every voting demographic across racial, ethnic, and partisan lines wants to protect the integrity and sovereignty of this great nation. There is nothing bigoted or immoral with wanting to protect our nation and our nation's unique character and sovereignty. There is nothing moral about frittering it all away on bankrupt ideologies and cynical vote-grabbing schemes. This land is my land, to quote half of a song from the early 20th century. This land is my land, and if this land is your land too, then you should want to protect it. Thank you very much. <laughs>